Hi everyone, here we are at the start of a new chapter, Economic Transformations, Commerce and Consequence. And we're going to start our study about economic transformations in the uh, modern era with Europeans and Asian commerce. Okay, the Atlantic slave trade. So this 18th century French engraving shows the sale of enslaved Africans at Gore, a major slave trading port in what is now Dakar in Senegal. A European merchant and an African authority figure negotiate the arrangement while the shackled victims themselves wait for their fate to be decided. So what does this image tell historians about the relationship between Europeans and Africans in the Atlantic slave trade? Well, this image depicts a European nego <coughs> excuse me, negotiating with an African slaver, demonstrating that Africans played me uh, mediating roles in the acquisition of slaves in Africa. All right, Europeans wanted commercial connections with Asia. So Columbus and Vasco da Gama saw, uh, both sought a route to Asia. Their motivation above all was the desire for spices, though other Eastern products were also sought. European civilization had finally recovered from the Black Death, and national monarchies were learning to govern more effectively. And some cities were becoming international trade centers and growing. And the problems of the old trade system from the Indian network uh, included the Muslims controlled the supply, Venice was the chief intermediary for trade, and other states resented it because many of those Italian states, especially Venice, had grown, Venice had grown rich. The desire to find Prester John and enlist his support in the Crusades, and then, of course, the constant trade deficit with Asia. All right, a Portuguese empire... Of commerce. So the Indian Ocean Commercial Trade Network, let's uh, talk about that. It's huge, very rich, ethnically diverse, and quite peaceful. The Portuguese did not have goods of quality for effective competition, so they took to piracy on the sea lanes. The Portuguese ships were more maneuverable and they carried cannons. They established fortified bases at key locations, locations particularly Mombasa, Hormuz, Goa, Malacca, and Macau. The Portuguese created a quote-unquote trading post empire. The goal was to control commerce, not territories or populations. And they were operated by force of arms, not economic competition. And at its height, they controlled about half of the spice trade to Europe. And the Portuguese gradually assimilated to Indian Ocean trade patterns. They carried Asian goods to Asian ports. Many Portuguese settled in Asian or African ports. And their trading post empire was steep in decline, hello, uh, however, by 1600. All right, so this is a map that shows Europeans in Asia in the early modern era. So the early modern era witnessed only very limited territorial control by Europeans in Asia. Trade rather than empire was the chief concern of the Western newcomers, who were not in any event a serious military threat to major Asian states. So where were the Dutch-controlled territories concentrated? Where were the Portuguese territories concentrated? Well, the Dutch-controlled areas in the eastern Indian Ocean, including Sumatra, Java, some of the Moluccas Islands, and Sri Lanka. The Portuguese-controlled areas on the African coast. So let's think about uh, this particular map. What distinguished the European empires of the early modern period from some that we might remember from the early 20th century? Are there any similarities? Well, by the early 20th century, more European powers had imperialized Southeast Asia, controlling it almost completely. Moreover, the British had removed the Dutch from Ceylon or Sri Lanka, and the United States had removed the Spanish from the Philippines. However, the Dutch presence continued and expanded in the Dutch East Indies. And we'll learn more about um, that in uh, further chapters. All right. So the spice trade, for thousands of years, spices were a major trade item in the Indian Ocean Commercial Network, as this 15th century French depiction of the gathering of pepper in southern India illustrates. In the early modern era, Europeans gained direct access to this ancient network for the first time. So just because the Europeans are new does not mean that the trade network is new. So how could a historian use this image to explain European views toward native workers in the Indian Ocean spice trade? The workers are smaller than the figure on the right, are scantily clad, and are doing the labor, while the figure on the right has lighter skin, 
is well-dressed and appears to be inspecting what the smaller figures have harvested. Now, this tells us that Europeans viewed native workers as inferior and uncivilized, but also as a necessary component of the spice trade. Spain and the Philippines. All right, Spain was the first to challenge Portugal's control of Asian trade. Um, they created an establishment of a Spanish base in the Philippines. The Philippines were organized in small competitive chiefdoms. They were run from colonial Mexico. The Spanish conquest was relatively easy and quite bloodless, involving gifts, alliances, gunpowder weapons, or Catholic rituals. And the major missionary campaign made Filipino society the only major Christian outpost in Asia. The Spaniards introduced forced relocation, tribute, taxes, and even unpaid labor. There are large of states of Spanish settlers, uh, religious orders, and the Filipino elite. Women's rituals and healing roles were attacked. Manila, a uh, major city in the Philippines, became a major center with a quite diverse population. Now, the Chinese, they were essential to the colonial trade system. They resisted conversion and occasionally revolted. And their Spanish expulsions and massacres, approximately 20,000 are killed in 1603. All right, the East India Companies. Okay, so the Dutch and English both entered the Indian Ocean commerce in the early 17th century, and they soon displaced the Portuguese, and they were competing directly with each other. Around 1600, both the Dutch and English organized private trading companies to handle the Indian Ocean trade. Uh, the merchants invested and shared in the risks of these companies. The Dutch and British East India Companies were chartered by their respective governments. And later, France created a company in 1664. And these companies had power to make war and govern, govern conquered peoples, um, as well as other major um, uh, duties that uh, governments or countries themselves can do. They established their own trading post empires, essentially. The Dutch Empire was focused on Indonesia, while the English Empire was focused on India. And then the French Company was also established. And the Dutch East Indian Company, let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, they monopolized both shipping and production of cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, and mace. They seized small spice-producing islands and forced people to sell only to the Dutch. They killed, enslaved, or starved 15,000 on Banda Island. And they destroyed the local economy of the spice islands, but it made the Dutch rich. Now, the British East Indian Company... I was not as well financed or as commercially sophisticated as the Dutch, but they couldn't break into the Spice Islands. They established three major trading settlements in India in the 17th century, Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras. Now, the British Navy gained control of the Arabian Sea and the Persian Gulf, but they could not compete with the Mughal Empire on land. Now, the British negotiated with the local rulers for peaceful establishment of trade bases, and the Britons traded pepper and other spices, but also got cotton textiles, and that became more important. Now, the Dutch and English also became involved in, quote-unquote, carrying trade within Asia, particularly bulk goods. Now, both gradually evolved into uh, typical colonial domination. All right, a European view of Asian commerce. So various East India companies, the British, the French, and the Dutch, represented the major vehicle for European commerce in Asia during the early modern era. This wall painting dating from 1778 entitled The East Offering Its Riches to Britannia hung in the main offices of the British East India Company. So using evidence from the image, how did Europeans view themselves in their trade relationship with Asian societies? Well, the painting uses symbolism from the European Greek and Roman past, the Europeans are portrayed as classical gods and goddesses and therefore appear to be superior to all others. Now, the native population appears to be supplicant and seems to be offering goods, probably spices, to the quote-unquote gods in return for good treatment and peace. Thereby, the native population is viewed as subservient to the Europeans. All right, Europeans and Asian commerce. So the European presence was much less significant in Asia than in the Americas or Africa. Europeans were no real military threat to the great powers in Asia. Uh, Siam was able to expel the French in 1688. Japan, 
Um, the Portuguese reached Japan in the mid-16th century. Japan was divided by constant conflict among their feudal lords, the daimyo, each supported by their warriors called samurai. And at first, the Europeans were welcome, but Japan unified politically under the Tokugawa shogun in the early 17th century, and that led to increasingly regarding the Europeans as a threat to this new unity. So they, we see the expulsion of missionaries, massive persecution of Christians, Japanese were barred from traveling abroad, and European traders were banned except the Dutch at a single site. And Japan was closed off from Europe from 1650 to 1850, but remained connected to China, Korea, and other parts of Southeast Asia. There's also a wave of Japanese merchants that moved into Southeast Asia in the 17th century, and they used violent means similar to Europeans. The Japanese government refused to support these merchants in their criminal behavior, unlike the European states. Now, the Asian merchants continued to operate despite European presence. Their overland trade within Asia remained in Asian hands. Tens of thousands of Indian merchants lived throughout Central Asia, Persia, and even Russia. And some Indian family firms monopolized the buying and selling of specific products. And that concludes our study of Europeans and Asian commerce. I will see you guys next time for silver, silver and global commerce.